Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's apparently very early for some people, but uh, um, we kind of imagined it to be a con continuation of the Ethereum Magician session uh, we had, I think, on the first day. But the focus for, for today would be EAPs related to EVM. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's this possibility um, to take a mic and and describe or pitch for EAP you are interested in, and we can discuss and maybe ask questions from the audience. Um, so, if anyone wants to start, if not, I can take like five minutes, ten minutes to 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 talk about EOF, the like three five EIP proposals we have uh, drafted so far. So this is a this is a slide for all my lightning talk about EOF, uh, but mostly uh, what I wanted to to, to have on the screen is <coughs> the five five EIPs we have. Two first are two first are potentially scheduled for for Shanghai, uh, which means the next uh, ex execution layer upgrade. A they define the the kind of the basic of the EOF structure. So EOF, EOF stands for EVM Object Format and is uh, and is uh, a kind of an our idea to structure the, the EVM programs in the way that they are kind of behave more predictable way. So that we know where the data is in the program, we know the code is, and we can version programs, so that, that also gives us some additional backwards uh, compatibility features. Um, and on top of that, we can build additional features. And these three uh, uh, additional features are the, the next three IPs on the list. So firstly, um, uh, EOF allows us to, to define uh, instructions in, in a bit different way. Uh, so we can have some immediate values, means the opcode can be followed by additional numbers. That means something to the, the instruction that will interpret it, uh, that will interpret the, um, uh, the values following. That wasn't possible before because of the backwards compatibility of existing EVM. So you can, in the current EVM, you can <coughs> craft a program that, <coughs> that will break if you uh, interpret inter, uh, values following opcodes in a different way. Um, so these static jumps are more efficient than current ones, and also uh, there's also easy, easier to analyze from, from ex external tools and also from the code validation in the EVM itself. And additionally, um, uh, the, the next one is EOF functions, which means uh, we can additionally partition the, the EVM code into separate, separate sections, we, uh, meaning uh, individual native functions in the EVM, and the additional instructions that allows you to go between these, two, between these uh, partitions. And all combined with the static jumps and the functions, we can get rid of, of existing uh, dynamic jumps in the EVM, which um, it should improve e efficiency, and most importantly, we can get rid of, of jump disk analysis. Um, so this, the jump disk analysis is a, is a process that has to be performed before we can start even executing EVM programs currently. And uh, it's pro like the, the cost of doing that is proportional to the to the, to the size of the code, and none of the cost of EVM execution actually reflects this, uh, this analysis. And, and lastly, uh, we can also put additional uh, verification uh, in the EOF format. That will allow you to, to check statically before deploying the code. If, if a function uh, performs stack overflow or possibly stack underflow, and we can reject such programs. Such programs would be, by definition, a bit more restrictive than the current ones. Uh, 
so there's some so there are some tricks you can do in current EVM that would not be possible anymore, but I think most of the compilers that target CVM doesn't really exploit this uh, this exploit this uh, properties. Um, so that also brings some additional e efficiencies because you can kind of check for correctness in at least in the terms of stack behavior uh, during deploy time and you don't have to repeat these checks uh, right later during execution. Okay, so that's, that's all I can say in five minutes about that. Um, so yeah, I'm open to answer some questions and also if someone wants to join on stage and talk about some interesting EVM stuff, uh, pl uh, yeah. Okay, I have been spending the week trying to better understand EOF. Um, and one question I have is, um, so I understand you, know, you have different versions uh, of EOF that you can implement, um, but you can also add there are, there are additions to the to an EOF version that can be done without a version bump. Um, can you like walk through what are like the proposals of, of you know of those fives and maybe others that, that you have? Like which one require a version bump, which one don't, and how how would you think about like deploying the whole thing over time? Uh, okay, so um, so the the first two kind of the basics of EOF. Uh, will be introduced with version one and and remaining like three additionals uh, will require the, the version bump. Um, and um, this is kind of the question, how many features we want to pack in into a single version. Um, so like has, originally we, we kind of wanted to split that and that's what also reason we have like five EAPs, not like single one, because people freak out if the EAP is big enough. So we kind of split it that um, into mo like multiple pieces, which also brings some inefficiency in the like in the design all of that because we need to update multiple documents. Um, so just to be clear, so like each, so like uh, 35, 40, 36, 70, they require, obviously you're introducing UOF requires to be one, but then there's none in the list of like 4200, 4750, and uh, the last one I can't see. But anyways, uh, yeah, okay. none in like the last three <laughs> yeah. uh, can be added. So you could add all three together and make EOF v2. Yes, exactly. And you, then, can, you can like combine how many features you want. Right. It's like up to kind of our... Yeah, what, what, what you, yeah what, you de what you define as a version. I mean, yeah. like multiple versions bring some like like new kind of complexity to the yeah. system we don't have so far, yeah. right? So currently when we change something to EVM, it's mostly time-based. So like, to, like to, to, to some point EVM works this way and from some point it, it, it works differently. So um, I think all the codes still like have all of the versions, historic versions, and because people care about executing every instruction from the beginning, but you can imagine you can design a client that only kind of has like the recent two or something like that. So can kind of scrap the code that is and like do the, the full thing, which means doesn't execute the, the transactions, just collects the state and goes on from that. Uh, I think nobody did so far this way, but uh, it's possible. And like this like EOF itself will like introduce kind of the new EVM that will run next to the, the legacy one and they will be able to communicate within the single transaction, right? Yeah. So you can have like legacy contract that calls the new one and the new one called the old one and like nothing breaks on this level, but it will have kind of two parallel EVMs. And uh, yeah, just to, to follow up. So like of the, say like the, the last three, are there any, say we were to split that in like two in one or like three hard forks, uh, <clears throat> like are there any that don't require a version bump or do they each, as long as they're not shipped together, will all the time require a version bump. Um, I think the the static relative jump doesn't require a version bump at all. So um, the like kind of the forward forward, what is the forward backward? No, the forward compatibility of EOF is that you can always drop new instruction into it without version bump. So whatever you add to instruction can be like whatever of any complexity. You can always do that because we make sure the opcodes 
that are undefined currently are not used in the programs. So like we can, yeah, we can drop the static relative jumps uh, like without version bump. Um, but I'm kind of, uh, I don't know, I, like my feeling is like, it's probably like better to pack as many features I, uh, as we have capacity for. So we don't have multiple EOF versions later, right? Uh, <laughs> what about the, the backwards compatibility of packing in um, new optional EOF format sections? Like if EOF functions was separate from the code section and provided data on top of it, same with the stack validation information, it was it had a separate section number um, that would go on top of it. I mean, could those be done in a forward compatible way that doesn't break things? Um. Let me think. Uh, so, so far we didn't like, actually like, think about this way, but uh, maybe that would be the way to, to design it in the way we can actually drop this feature later without a version bump. Uh, EOF update. functions requires separate code block, right? Yeah, yeah, but you can kind of, uh, so the, the thing is you can like, when you have something mandatory, you can make it optional later, right? So, uh, because kind of the, the previous deployed contracts will, all, will have this thing there, but if it's optional, it's still fine. So maybe there's a way to have like single code section with the information that maybe later will enable like more code sections. So like single code section contracts from before will still work, will just have single function there. So maybe there's a way to design it in the like forward compatibility way so we don't have to version bump. Uh, that's I think nice idea I haven't really thought about before. Would adding a um, minor version in the EOF header be useful to indicate that I'm, I require these uh, forward compatible changes, but I'm compatible with a backward compatible interpreter? Kind of like HDMI 1.1, 1. <laughs> 1, 2.1? 1. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it's like still like system, like all the, all the contracts have to like do exactly uh, like the same things and like this not really like optional thing you can perform. Uh, in the sense that like, all the clients have to behave the same way. So I'm not sure like the, actually the, the having like minor version will make any change, uh, ma ma make any difference. So either it behaves differently or not. So if it's okay. like two versions numbers, I don't think that makes any difference. Okay, I mean, I guess I just thought that Slitty could always just pack it so in the, the data like, section too. Yeah, maybe like the functions, there's a way to do it. I think we will need to like take a look into this. And the last one, probably not because it just adds additional requirements of the code structure. So the previous programs probably will not follow these. Um, do, you, do I understand correctly that the last EIP doesn't uh, require the version bump because it's just the change on the EVM side? So it's uh, not e in the bytecode and, and you can do it uh, whenever you want? No, the, actually the, one, the, the last one actually requires the, the version bump because it puts additional restriction rules on the code. So it means we want to make sure that like, when you load the, the, the EVM program from database and you see the version number, you know exactly what you can expect from the code. So if, you, like, if, if some rules are not there at the deploy time, it means that the program you load from that era will, like, have, different, uh, will have different structure and you can't rely on it anymore. Yeah, got it, thanks. So um, unfortunately, I've only just come across e um, the EOF, um, but um, uh, so, I'm, so I'm guessing um, that the intention of these changes is to make it easier to do static analysis on the EVM code, particularly imputing predecessors to basic blocks, which is always a challenge with EVM at the moment. Um, and doing static translation will become a lot easier. Um, um, you, like, you mean like external tools or like all of the... Uh... Well, uh, so my, my, I've got sort of three main use cases. Um, so one is stat static st and a symbolic execution, for example. Um, uh, another is translation translated to x86. Um, um, and another is um, uh, do, you know, do, doing static analysis of contracts to see if they're valid. Um, so I imagine that all these things are gonna help out with that. Um, so like, I think our main goal about control flow changes is to just get rid of jump this analysis and make it more efficient. But we kind of expect to be also, like the EOF programs to be 
much easier to be analyzed uh, by the external tools. But I think we just need like actually inputs from you, like like you probably should like take a look and to see like if it helps or not, like how much it helps because that's not really like area of our expertise. Uh, but uh, yeah, we kind of expect it to be much easier to do it analysis externally. Yes, certainly st static static jumps will help enormously. Um, no, because okay. of the but because of the predecessor problem essentially. Um, we need to talk about you know yes. distribution of of this. <laughs> Beautiful. So. ARM has a zero register. There's a lot of register machines out there. Push zero will also be quite convenient. Um, Fuel also has taken the zero register from ARM in their virtual machine. The EVM currently has the gas counter and the program counter, and I think they're registers. When registers? Oh, this way. Uh, I thought you would start talking about pool zero EIP because there's one on the list. Uh, so maybe you want to talk about it? No, okay. I have. <laughs> Uh, so okay, like let me start like from the from the back. Uh, there is like one AAP that introduces like pool zero instructions. I think this is what is kind of analogous to ARM and all of that. So the it's just to like make sure like people don't use like kind of exotic way of like M size or all of that to push zero on the stack. So we just will delegate one instruction to do exactly this with the same gas cost of the kind of the hacks we currently have. Uh, and that's also scheduled from Shanghai, if I remember, right? Can anyone confirm that? Okay, what I think it is. <laughs> and um, so that's one thing. Uh, registers in EVM, probably never. Uh, so this like EOF stuff looks already complex enough that uh, I don't know, like what is the time scale we can deploy it or Maybe it's it's it will never be deployed on the mainnet. Um, but the, the thing is, like it has kind of different structure, so we kind of design the EVM loop interpreter loop differently. But the instructions they operate on are kind of shared between legacy and new one. And I think that's the current current direction we're going with. So nobody proposed like radical changes. I think like radical change would be just to take some other EVM. Like I don't know, we try to help assembly. Maybe the fuel VM, and I'd put it somewhere on L2 or whatever. What <laughs> uh, I don't expect to see so drastic changes to EVM. It's kind of the same. It's kind of the same of as the question like why do we have 256 bit size words, right? <laughs> and we, I probably there's also not like a not really option to short it to something smaller. Yeah. All right, one more question. <laughs> hey, um, uh, so Greg Colvin's got his simple subroutines EIP as well. Uh, could you explain how that is different than these? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I will sit down because <laughs> um, I, so those some, um, I'm sure I can I can give a full picture, so maybe someone will jump and help me. But I can start with that. It kind of wanted to introduce this subroutines, which are kind of analogous to what the, our functions are um, to existing EVM. Um, so there, there were some technical issues. Like one is about having these immediate values uh, in the instruction, which are not like fully backwards compatible. And secondly, um, it kind of doesn't really help with this analysis. So this was one, one, because for the simplicity, the jumps will still work the same and they can cross the subroutines easily. So you can use the new instructions to kind of form kind of the sub codes in the code, but jumps will like go whatever they want. And it doesn't really help with analysis outside of that, and it doesn't really help to do kind of fancy compilation. Uh, by fancy compilation, I mean, you can take like subroutine and compile it to like native code and something, and then use the, the system call stack to, to implement subroutine calls. But because there's possibility to like 
jump through over or like jump out of the subroutine and go somewhere else that's really that doesn't fit into this model so uh but i'm not sure that was the reason that the the chain didn't went through maybe there was some other reasons um yeah i mean he's he's updated that proposal again since it was last rejected i don't know if you've seen those updates yeah yeah uh, i kind of noticed but uh yeah, I, I'm not sure this is like the, I mean, the, the, the AP is kind of up, being updated and I I'm, I'm, have a little trouble to keep track like which version we're talking about right now. Uh, but I know there's some changes, but this is like still kind of something we should consider for future upgrades or, or not, because I'm not sure like if that's candidate for, for anything. Uh, hi, so I just have one question. Are there any uh, technical barriers for implementing 3074? I'm really bad at numbers. Can you tell like which EIP it is? Old school. Oh, this one. Ah, I have no idea, honestly. Maybe someone can help. Okay. No, you're not helping. <laughs> um, no, I text. I don't know really. Uh, so I think like on the technical level, probably not so many. I think it's mostly like social level, which is problematic or like this like some way you can trick people to do something and there is no way back or uh, but i i am not an expert on this one actually so i don't think i can answer this go ahead you get to be a dictator here if you had to dream up in store two what would it be or say, say like you're not changing the existing memory you just get to do memory from scratch how would you go about it but you, you mentioned I store, right? Oh, uh, M store. Like, is in like, oh, yeah. just like, oh, we're doing yeah. memory differently here. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's that's a good question. Um, so, like, we didn't put anything like any kind of draft, but we we have some thought about that. And there was some, some input fr from Vitalik as well recently about how to kind of model that. Um, I think this, like, multiple dimensions you can try to kind of describe it like one is uh, that current mo memory allows you to just just use whatever index you want you will just pay more gas for it and that was kind of calculated and so you kind of the memory automatically expands to, to the to the use and uh, that's a kind of different way of doing that. So you kind of have to explicitly inform the VM upfront, like, okay, please allocate more, more, more memory for me. And, and if you use something that is outside of the allocation, it will just terminate execution, right? And, um, and the second one is, this, this is the model that WebAssembly uses. Right, so that you, that you need to kind of allocate memory upfront, and you can't use it if it's not allocated. And uh, so this is like one way you can select from. I think at least Solidity was happy with this automatic allocation, but I'm I'm not sure I can confirm that. Is anyone from Solidity here? Okay, no. I mean, Solidity is kind of happy that like memory automatically expands. To new indexes and you don't have to maintain the like know how much you did allocated or so it would be fine to have the the evm when you have to kind of declare to evm that you need more memory that'll be good or not yeah so uh, uh, no statically analy statically analyzing the maximum memory size is a challenging problem at the moment and uh, you know, if, if there was something in the EOF to specify the maximum memory size, that would probably be quite useful. So, so uh, okay, yeah. So if I get it right, you would prefer the system when you have to kind of explicitly say how, many, how much memory you would use or something like that. It, it, it's not absolutely necessary because, in, for instance, solid, no, Solidity is extremely facile and very easy to analyze, but there are okay. other contracts which aren't. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, so this is one aspect and like kind of we don't have a winner here so far. And like from EVM implementation, I would prefer to somehow lower the, the housekeeping of memory. So whenever you execute one of the memory instructions, like this like mload, mstore, 
like most of the time EVM is spending just to calculating the cost, like if it's like new instruction, like if the index, index is not like absolutely huge or something like that, and just like accessing the memory is like, this is, this is nowhere in the, on the profile, right? So uh, I think like to, to keeping the housekeeping lower, uh, maybe combining the explicit allocation and do the like cost by memory pages or something like that would just help. But we didn't prototype any of that so far. So they're kind of rough ideas. But you can do quite interesting stuff if you have memory pages in yes. the in VM implementation. Yes, it's, it's a very similar problem to the uh, SPUs on the PlayStation 3, for example. You, you have sort of the minimum register size was 128 bits. Um, so, so the EVM is extremely similar to the to the SPU on the PlayStation, um, and uh, that was a that was an interesting challenge as well. But, uh, okay, <laughs> that means like PlayStation runs EVM now. <laughs> <laughs> PlayStation was a bit quicker. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> I think everything is quicker than EVM, right? <laughs> Also, just declaring all my questions are the lowest, like they're the fallback ones. Anyone can interrupt and take priority. Um, oh, there's someone. <laughs> beautiful. Here we go. Hi. Um, are there any um, hardware implementation of EVM or maybe FPGA ASIC uh, that you know of? And if there is, what were their biggest hurdle? Aside from M Store, I'm guessing, because that's a pain, but otherwise. I mean, async on like memory access level or the storage access level? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can help here, but uh, I I know like some people try, we're trying, ex we're experimenting with having like async way of accessing storage. Oh, async, okay. Okay, uh, wow. Uh, so we had a pro we had a project called EVM Jet, which just was compiling EVM bytecode into, let's say, x86, like native code. And the performance was great, but the cost of compiling that was also big. So that's kind of the trade-off. And at some point we just scrap it. It's somewhere around, but uh I think you have a difficult time to decide like which context you want to compile to native code if you don't have to. I, I, you might have misunderstood my question. Sorry, uh, let me restate it. So has there been anyone implementing a physical hardware machine that executes EVM? Yeah, so, so it's got nothing to do with JIT. So, okay. <laughs> sorry, just yeah, purely okay. you get an, an opcode, it decodes it, it executes the code. Uh, what I, yeah, what I wanted to, okay, yeah. I kind of wanted to put it in perspective in the sense like that seems, at least to my opinion, that seems like more advanced because I don't know about this stuff at all. That like doing even JIT compilation, which is already hard. It's like compilation is not hard, but it's like time consuming. So you have to just squeeze this. If you if you have hardware, yeah. Uh, I think even if you had a hardware like that, the gas cost nowhere reflects like the performance of it, right? So I'm not sure how much you will save. You will save like you, your like machine com computational time, but it would not. I think it would not improve the network unless this like like most of the people use it. But I don't know if anyone tried that. I will be definitely interesting pro pro project to see how it works. Greg Colvin has infamously said that the EVM is a gas counting machine that does computation as a side effect. Do you think there could be any benefits to reducing the precision or the fidelity in terms of like how gradual uh, you're doing your gas accounting and so like paying for more gas things up front or even say like the memory case would be one case where uh, you pay for expansion or the escalation like the curve that it follows isn't actually like a smooth perfectly smooth curve naturally it sort of like has a flat region or like a, a sort of linear region then it goes like jumps up and then it jumps up again uh, do you think more things like that could be fine in the long run, or do you think we should be really good at counting really small units of gas? Um, it, I think depends a bit like what kind of instruction subset you mean. I think for memory, we should like take a look 
like yeah, how to improve gas gas housekeeping for these, for like like purely computational ones. Um, I think it's not so big deal right now. So um, the one thing is that the instructions actually do quite a lot because they are like 256-bit precision. So this like this is not like single CPU instruction you're doing, right? It's like this like like four plus loading. So it's like 20 instructions you do, like your your CPU will be doing for the single instruction. It depends what instruction it is, but uh, it's actually quite a lot. So you kind of can hide the latency of gas computation there. So kind of the CPU is doing the, the computation itself and also calculates gas. So the overhead of disabled gas calculation, it's not, I mean, if you have really efficient EVM implementation, it's it can be like 7%, maybe 10%. So this is not like huge amount. Uh, and the same for the stack checks and all of that. But yeah, so uh, I I don't know what like for EVM I would keep it as it is. I think it's not so bad. Uh, definitely the simple simple gas rules will help, but I wouldn't change it like to be some kind of different precision or, or whatever. Uh, but we also don't want like complicated gas rules that doesn't bring anything. So the the memory is unfortunately like another this like example one once more, which means you just compute this like 32 bit chunks of memory, which like you need to do some additional computation to, to calculate the gas cost. If it that was, would be per byte, it would be simpler and the effect would be the same, right? So you don't want to over design it definitely, but I think like in general, it's kind of, it's okay. No, for most, most basic blocks, you can calculate the gas costs up front. Um, and just just calculate it with the whole basic block, and obviously things like S store and so on are yeah. variable. But um, but um, for you know for many many basic blocks, you can you can as this guy probably tell you, you can you can pre-compute it. But. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, like with one like like comment that it's like for the basic gas cost. Mm -hmm. Some instruction has like basic cost, and then like like variabic variadic gas cost depending on the arguments and, and something like that. Yeah, we did try that, like even the EVM implementation. And it it brings, I think, some performance, but uh, I think we kind of scrapped the idea. Yeah, <laughs> because, the of, because you need like additional analysis phase to like yes. pre-calculate that. Yes. And you have to, and uh, so, uh, quick, quick, like description how it was done in EVM one. There was like the old interpreter that was doing this, and the analysis cost was really big. And we kind of transitioned to like simple design but efficient design of EVM, which doesn't do that anymore. And the new one is actually faster than the old one. But to be fair, the old one didn't get so much attention recently. So maybe there's some like performance you can gain from it, but it won't be really big one if you have efficient EVM. So like simplicity wins so far. It, yeah. At least in like the client client yeah. perspective, right? Yeah, so certainly my, my experience is the EVM is a tiny part of the cost of the whole system anyway. So which possibly answers the sort of why don't we have a um, an FPGA EVM, which would obviously be trivial to do. But, uh, 11.53, otherwise known T-Store T-Load, uh, one by Alexi okay. years ago. Do you have any thoughts on that? And specifically to the memory problem, would that reduce some of these pressures on reforming memory? Because, you know, you've got this transient storage. It's not hitting disk. It's pretty cheap. How do you feel about 11.53? So um, I'm not sure if I'm on the same page with this one, but does it like have the same kind of like map uh, map structure that this storage has, right? So uh, yeah, it's like for me, the, the issue is that you have this like map structure there. So it's like, not like this is like chunk of memory. You actually have like hash map or like whatever the implementation is. Because uh, as I remember, it was like doing the same. You have like unlimited number of 256 bit slots you can assign to. So the, the EVM, has to kind of have a map of that, which it can scrap at the end of the transaction, right? If, um, do you want it in Shanghai? 
uh, like me personally, I I don't know. It's like I'm kind of kind of affected by that. Um, so like how how actually I vision EVM is like this kind of below that. So I kind of mostly focus on the like single core. So the this transient storage it's it's like problematic in the way that I have to kind of outsource it somewhere else. So like the client of like client has to provide some way, some API to actually access it because like for, for my EVM at least, it's that I just start the EVM context on the, when you enter the call and I end it there. So I don't have anything that lasts above that. So, but yeah, I'm kind of transitioning to like this, the transaction level EVM execution. Um, I think like the, the ultimate question is like usability of that. And like, if there's like strong enough number of use cases that will that make it uh, like desired, right? And I think that some people really push hard for it. Um, I have a follow-up question on that. Do you think the the cost of a TS of a do you want to? <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. Do you think the cost of uh, or the potential cost of a T store would be that much lower than the S store? I mean, the basic one is kind of like 100, right? For the currently, for the S store, like the minimum you can get if this is like accessed slot and something. I, no, I, but I mean, yeah, maybe. It, yeah. What, what are the numbers in the I proposals? It, I phrase it like the number is sure, but like, do you think like in the machine, would it, would it really be that different? Like from my perspective, it's not any different to access S store uh, because I'm kind of have a buffer of like this cache of this S store. And I like from like yeah from like the like the core EVM side it's not much different, uh, but I think it's like it, so the difference is when you have to actually go to the database on disk or not and like this is guaranteed not to be the case so, right but so you don't have to do any database lookup at all so so yeah probably it should be cheaper but I know how much <laughs> yeah do you think another alternative solution would be to just fix the pricing of S store um, and S -Lib. I think historically we did fix the pricing of S store in every hard fork, right? Exactly. <laughs> if you see the like S store implementation, there's like, like this yeah, is multiple lines MS, of like yeah. different revisions of EVM. So I don't know, maybe we can't get it right. So we need, we need a replacement for it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to fix it like more. Uh, it's already super complicated, so maybe that's, uh, maybe that's maybe that's an argument pro um, T load T store. Yeah, I can't be sure. I mean, it's like I would be sure if like there was like group that actually tried to fix the store, so it's 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 competitive feature than the the transit storage. But I think there's not such group so far. So uh, maybe we just have to pick one option of of one. So I don't know. How much easier would life be if the EVM was 64-bit? <coughs> or does it not really make much of a difference to your work? If maybe my colleagues can help me with that. We did experiment with WebAssembly and uh, for some use case that EVM is used for, it's it really helps when it's this 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 big word size. So all this like balance calculations, all of this like fixed point arithmetic, it's really hard if you, so. If you need to emulate like bigger numbers in the smaller, like this, like more like smaller, like 64 bit word size, it's just, it's really horrible. And when you, when you have like simple design, like interpreter and stuff, so you need like to drop a lot of instructions to emulate that. And it was really bad on some workloads. So uh, I, we can't confirm it's like the best, the, the, the best word size, but for some use case, it really helps. 